we return to the bottomless well of the Second World War to hear two freshly told tales, both set in Eastern Europe and both in part or in total, told from the perspective of a child. Daniel Torday, our first presenter, directs the creative writing department at Bryn Mawr College. His stories and essays have appeared in such publications as the New York Times, Glimmer Trained, and Esquire, where he worked for some time as an editor. In 2012, Dan won the National Jewish Book Award for his novella, The Sensualist. FYI, that short sentence encapsulated about seven years of writing. For Dan, not for me. Dan's debut novel, The Last Flight of Poxel West, which received an impressive cover review in the New York Times last March, explores the reconciliation of the true nature of family and loss through the daring do of a Czechoslovakian war hero. Let me uh, embarrass Dan a bit here by quoting a collection of Times reviews. It's Mr. Torday's ability to shift gears between sweeping historical vistas and more intimate family dramas and between old school theatrics and more contemporary meditations on the nature of storytelling that announces his emergence as a writer deserving of attention. And all of this is rendered in Torday's unobtrusively lyrical prose, superb Rothian sentences that glide over the page as smoothly as a spitfire across a cloudless sky. Our second presenter, Jim Shepard, is known as a writer's writer, which means that the quality of his craft is clearly recognized by his colleagues. I'm not one of his colleagues, but I can tell you that that sentence is beyond right. Shepard is the author of six novels and four story collections, including Project X, and like you'd understand anyway, a finalist for the National Book Award and winner of the Story Prize. His short fiction has, has appeared nearly ubiquitously from the Paris Review to Playboy. His new novel provides a child's eye view of the atrocity, tragedy, and resilient humanity found in wartime, in the wartime Warsaw Ghetto. The Washington Post reviewer Ron Charles writes, the book of Aaron is a story of su such startling candor about the complexity of heroism that it challenges each of us to greater courage. Shepard has created something transcendent and timeless in this slim masterpiece, a portrait of an exhausted but determined man locked in a feudal battle he will not concede. And with that, please welcome our first presenter, Daniel Torday. Hello, can you hear me in the back? All right, that's the most important question of the night. Well, thank you guys so much for uh, coming out. Uh, I've been coming to events here at the Free Library forever, so it's uh, awfully exciting to be able to be up here on stage. I wanted to say uh, briefly before I read to you a little bit from the book, first of all, thanks to Andy Kane for having me into the library. It's uh, a great excitement to be here. Um, but I also wanted to just say briefly something about Jim Shepard. Uh, I have a tendency when I'm writing to, to want to kind of have these like very clear literary antecedents in the background. So for my first book, uh, Dostoevsky, it was like this big sort of background writer for me. One of the characters is based on a character from Brothers Karamazov. Um, when it came time to write this book, one of the first things I turned to was Jim Shepard. Uh, Jim's book, Paper Doll, is a really important book for me about uh, the, the US Air Force. Uh, and at times I would sort of like jump back to that. Um, one of his stories, Love and Hydrogen, which is one of my favorite short stories of all time, is to me is just like an absolute masterwork of what it means to take research and distill it and turn it into something um, that that feels like a, a you know a literary masterpiece. Um, so since Dostoevsky couldn't be here tonight, it's pretty cool that Jim Shepard is. Uh, <laughs> Dostoevsky's dead. Um, <laughs> Exactly. It, I, I did also want to say that, that then I have this kind of experience while I'm reading, writing, and then reading my own work back. Where, um, like, I often don't really know what I'm writing about. Like, I'll have a draft, and I kind of, I kind of want to get a sense of what it is, and um, I'll kind of ask like readers, well, well, what is it? Um, and there's this thing that writers have to do when a book is ready to come out, which is getting blurbs. Do you guys know about what a blurb is? So writers will sort of write on the back of your book um, what's, um, what, what's, what it's about and what's good about it. And um, when we reached out to Jim Shepard to write about this book, he had a couple sentences that came back. And there was that moment, you know, six months before publication, where I was like, oh, right, like, that's what this book is about. Uh, so we're really uh, all lucky that he's here tonight. Um, and, and I just finished reading the book of Aaron, and it's an incredible book. So I'm excited to hear him read from it. <laughs> 
So I'm going to read to you a little bit from, uh, from this book, The Last Light of Poxo West. Can you still hear me in the back? Thanks. Thanks for nodding. Uh, there are two voices here. One is Poxel West. Uh, his story is presented as a memoir that he's written. He, he's flown for the Royal Air Force, the British Royal Air Force. Um, the, the other voice is Eli Goldstein, his, his young uh, nominal nephew. So I'm going to read to you a little bit from, from Eli's portions, uh, and then I will take a seat and we'll hear Jim Shepard. Uh, so these sections are called Acknowledgement. This is called Acknowledgement Prologue. Before halftime on Super Bowl Sunday, January 1986, my uncle Poxel came over. He was just months from reaching the height of his fame and unaware the game was being played. He wasn't technically my uncle either. He was an old friend of the family. For years he had taught at a prep school in Cambridge where my grandfather had served as a dean. After a massive heart attack a year after I was born, left my grandfather as much a memory to me as thin morning fog. Uncle Poxel came to fill the void. That Sunday, he sat down in the living room and speaking over the game's play-by-play, -play, started a story he could barely clap his gloves free of snow fast enough to tell. A miracle had occurred that afternoon. His neighbor had died a few months back, and though my Uncle Poxel was consumed to the details of the upcoming publication of his first book, he'd advised the neighbor's sons on the handling of the estate. The neighbor was an obscure literary novelist who'd enjoyed a claim early and then none. Their father had left nothing more than his immense library and thousands of dollars of debt from a mortgage on a house too far in arrears to sell. Uncle Poxel had become immoderately involved in figuring a way to help them, though it wasn't clear what expertise they felt he could lend. Decades ago, he'd quit a job at British Airways to take a PhD in English literature, then later dropped his dissertation on Elizabethan drama to finish what would in time become the successful memoir of his time flying Lancaster bombers for the Royal Air Force. Maybe they assumed that because he had owned a number of houses and apartments, he had a certain familiarity with ownership. Maybe people just assumed from listening to his confident tone that my Uncle Poxel knew what he was talking about. He was falling behind in grading for his classes, and in the early spring he would hit the road for his book tour, but something hadn't let him give up this neighbor's case. Then today, Uncle Poxel said, as Steve Grogan missed a receiver with a pass, the deus ex machina. I had no idea what he meant at the time. I was barely 15, and what mattered back then were the Patriots and the Red Sox. A girl named Rachel Rosti and I was after in my Hebrew class who couldn't have cared less for some wizened British war hero. But that Sunday, I was too drawn in by his unerring voice, its dry gravity and utter self-belief, not to find out what happened to his neighbor's sons. Somehow his voice had found the only register that could drown out the game's clamorous announcers. Willie, the younger son, asked me if I'd help pack, Uncle Poxel said. He figured he'd give the books away. Poxel had noted my eyes on him now, not just my parents. The volume of his wry voice rose perceptibly. We were a dozen books in when I dropped Saul Bellows Herzog. I picked it up and a crisp hundred fluttered to the ground. Willie and I looked at it like it was, well, like it was a rabbi on a football field. He looked at me. The Bears scored. I missed the play and the replay. Julian had used hundred dollar bills as bookmarks in every one of his books. He'd get paid two hundred dollars a review and put half back in. They hadn't counted it all yet, but there must have been near to $100,000 in his books. He didn't write a review every week, but he wrote for that paper regularly and for others. Maybe he thought his sons would find it all. Willie doubted it, and I did too. We were a pile of cardboard boxes away from handing his estate to the Harvard Coop. Uncle Poxel kept talking, hauled along by the wonder of the thing. I'd rarely seen him so animated. This was the first time we'd spent alone with him since he'd finalized copy edits on his memoir, as an appearance, and his appearance at our house was a surprise, given the frigid air and snow outside. We'd assumed we wouldn't see him again until his first reading here in Boston, scheduled for the week after the book's publication date. I'd been longing to see him, my eccentric European uncle who'd lived so much life. But now, the Patriots were in the Super Bowl for the first time, and my tongue buzzed like it did after I woke from a nap. My mother changed the subject, and by then I'd stopped caring about the game. Would the contents of a book ever carry the same meaning again? This image of hundred-dollar bills spilling out of the pages of books would plague me for years. I tried to watch the end of the football game, but Grogan was awful. And a 300-pound Bears lineman noticed, quote, the refrigerator scored a touchdown 
and I couldn't set my mind to anything but my Uncle Poxel and when I'd finally get to read his stories between bound pages. As I say, my Uncle Poxel would reach the apex of his own literary success in the months ahead after his book finally made its way into the world. Every season, for as long as I could remember, Poxel had taken me to the opera, the symphony, to the Wang Center to see plays and musicals. If there was a performance of Shakespeare anywhere in our city, Poxel would find a way to take me. This wasn't the kind of thing that should have interested me. A trip to Femme was my idea of a cultural outing. But my Uncle Poxel was built like a power forward, and he moved as fluidly as a Bruin, and he was everything the other Jewish authority figures in my life weren't. On Monday, Monday and Wednesday afternoons, I suffered two hours of Hebrew school, and where our aging teachers would ply us with tales of woe, melancholy stories of the survivors of death camps and ghettoization. I remember seeing for the first time when I was only 10, the black numbers tattooed on a classmate's grandmother's wrist. I can see even now my young brain being tattooed with pensive fear. My grandfather had survived that period and reached the States, only to die before I'd gotten to know him. It compounded my sense then that history was some untrammeled force acting upon us, leveling any hope of heroism like some insuperable glacier flattening mountains to plains. Even the new young rabbi at our synagogue, Rabbi Ben Shine, who had come straight from Berkeley with a nappy beard and hair past his shoulders, calling us dude and trying to get us to talk Jewish mysticism, sat nodding solemnly as these stories were recited, fingertips tracing his copy of Night. I recognize now, of course, why we, why we were being inundated with these truths, but I was 15 and what I needed was a hero and hope. We might be able to see God's body in the Kabbalah's Tensafi wrote, but it was 1986, barely 40 years since our grandparents' generation sat desperate and faded in their East European neighborhoods. Never again our teachers encanted to us Monday after Monday, Wednesday after Wednesday. But when I picture myself in those rooms in the basement of our shul, even now, I can only hear the incantations reciprocal. It will happen again. Beware. Be always aware. But I was going to see myself as an exception then, too, for I was learning on those outings with Poxel West that I had an antidote in my own family. There was more thunder in my Uncle Poxel's senescent face than one strand of Rabbi Ben's unkempt mane, trailing him like the sweet whiff of cherry tobacco from a pipe smoker's coat was the fact that he'd been a pilot for the Royal Air Force, a Jewish war hero, the only one I'd ever heard of. I would have followed his broad shoulders into the ballet without embarrassment. Though his teaching job held a certain prestige, Uncle Poxel was an aspiring writer when we started on our trips. It was all he wanted in his later years to get down stories based on recollections of his youth and all he did with his free time. But in more than a decade, three novels had been rejected by New York editors. No matter how proud he was, his shoulders slumped a bit farther forward with each turning away. Still, my parents felt it an inherent good that Uncle Poxel serve as my monthly Virgil through the vague cultural life of downtown Boston. No accrual of rejections in New York could undo cultural currency in our small city. And any time spent with Poxel would do me good, they said. What I learned from my Uncle Poxel in those outings didn't come as we listened to Daniel Berenbaum play the Moonlight Sonata. After each event, Uncle Poxel would drive us out to Newtonville, where over Sundays at Cabot's, he would read passages to me from his latest project. This one not a novel, but a memoir. After his return from a trip to London for the funeral of a captain he'd served alongside in the Royal Air Force, he finally decided he would write a memoir of his, time, of his life during that time. He felt more comfortable writing fiction, but if it was a memoir the world needed, he'd write it. It wasn't much different from the novels he'd read to me from in the past. They were full of strange, awkward depictions of sex, scenes that looking back I now realize I was too young to be hearing. This new book felt overwrought at times, a feeling I wasn't too young to pick up on. But with this new project, suddenly the scenes he'd written were vibrant, absent the hesitations and wanderings of his earlier work. Even today, I feel a pride that borders on embarrassment, intuiting that those scenes were crafted to make my younger self accept them. This next section, Poxel said one night after four long hours of Don Giovanni, is the most gripping scene of all when the reader sees what we were really up against, the story of when the S. Sugar Bomber went down in a lightning storm. His hands flew up near his curly auburn hair. Uncle Poxel had one of those pointy red Ashkenazi faces whose very shape carries confidence and import. The bridge of his nose was so thin it simply faded into his high red brow. Atop his head he wore a trademark pork pie hat, the brown felt of which was always brushed. The hat's name wasn't lost on him. It's the closest to anything Trafe I ever come, he said. 
Out from the hat's side stuck shocks of his remaining translucent hair, which took light like a polished garnet. Lambent crimson ran to his cheeks through gossamer veins. But there was nothing varicose on my Uncle Poxwell's face. He was hale and lissom, a man of indeterminate age, but whose virility was discernible in the very color of his cheeks. He wore a black tweed Brooks Brothers suit with narrow lapels and a collar he'd popped against the Boston winter. He saw no need to smooth it down now that we were inside spinning pralines and cream. My squadron th flew into a thundercloud over Lubeck, he said. That's when the S sugar began to fly into a thundercloud too. Crack, boom, blue lightning. You've never seen anything like it. I asked him to read it to me instead of telling me about it. He'd written it down after all and I wanted to hear. And so he put his face to the loose pages before him and he read. The world around us dropped away as I listened to my Uncle Poxel read from his book. His hands spun dense nimbus clouds in the air between us as he narrated the bomber's bravery. This was an entirely different kind of war story than the ones we read at Hebrew school, a story not of survival, but of action. It was as if he was crafting his great account before my very eyes, and I don't know that I've been so close to history since. My Uncle Poxel was born in a small city north of Prague, but he had a diplomat's accent. His cars had ours, his parks too. And unlike the living survivors we met or whose books we read in Hebrew school, his tongue wasn't thick and muddy with Slavic consonants. As he described in the middle chapters of his book, I'd heard each of them as we talked over fudge and whipped cream, he'd been sent to London by way of a year in Rotterdam. By the time the Luftwaffe began bombing the East End, he was enlisted as a squatty. Poxel was a Jew who had flown for the Royal Air Force during the war and lived to write about it. Though he carried in his broad shoulders the complicated burden of his own actions in those days, he had wrested his fate from the inevitable bearing down of history upon his fellow Ashkenazi Jews. And not only that, but he'd lived to write about it. And write about it he did. Each time he finished a new chapter, he would take me somewhere new and recount to me his finest similes, the clearest arisen memory, the complicated feeling that arose as he remembered things he'd obviously spent most of his adulthood trying to forget, all for the sake of literature, for the sake of those who came after him. We talked about the fact that this is why men wrote, to leave behind their stories for those who would come years later. And I'm going to leave it to Jim there. Thank you. That was fun, Daniel. That was nice to hear. I want to thank the Free Library for inviting me. I want to thank Daniel for being so sweet. It's nice to be admired by people you admire. Um, I'm looking out at you guys and you're like, what do we care? <laughs> I just thought I'd say it, you know. Um, I'm going to go a little short so that we can get interactive uh, and that will give um, you guys a chance to be listless publicly um, and we can exchange ideas and stuff like that. Um, I'm going to read um, from the beginning of the novel Daniel mentioned. Um, and um, it occurred to me a while ago that... Um, being interested in children <clears throat> and being, and I've written about children my whole career, and, and being interested in catastrophe and um, anybody who grew up with the mother I grew up with would have to be interested in catastrophe. Um, and being interested in ethical passivity, um, it occurred to me that um, the Holocaust sort of brings those three together under maximum pressure. Um, and that's sort of where this novel began. Um, and it's, as you'll hear, it's set in Poland before and mostly during World War II and mostly in the Warsaw Ghetto. I'm going to read you right from the beginning so that there's absolutely nothing else I need to tell you in advance. Um, and then I'm just going to stop in order to maximize your displeasure. My mother and father named me Aaron, but my father said they should have named me What Have You Done? And my uncle told everyone they should have called me What Were You Thinking? I broke medicine bottles by crashing them together and let the neighbor's animals loose from pens. My mother said my father shouldn't beat such a small boy, but my father said that one misfortune was never enough for me. And my uncle told her that my kind of craziness was like stealing from the rest of the family. When I complained about it, my mother reminded me I had only myself to blame and that in our family, the cure for a toothache was to slap the other side of your face. 
My older brother was always saying we all went without cradles for our backsides or pillows for our heads. Why didn't he complain some more, my mother suggested. Maybe she could light the stove with his complaints. My uncle was my mother's brother, and he was the one who started calling me Shmaya because I did so many things that made him put his finger to his nose as a warning and say, God has heard. We shared a house with another family in Panavish near the Lithuanian border. We lived in the front room with a four-paned window and a big stove with a tin sheet on top. Our father was always off looking for money. For a while, he sold animal hides. Our mother wished he would do something else, but he always said the Pope and the peasant each had their own work. She washed other people's floors, and when she left for the day, our neighbors did whatever they wanted to us. They stole our food and threw our things into the street. Then she came home exhausted and had to fight with them about how they treated us, while I hid behind the rubbish pile in the courtyard. When my older brothers got home, they'd be part of the shouting, too. Where's Shmaya, they'd ask, when it was all over. I'd still be behind the rubbish pile. When the wind was strong, grit got in my eyes. Shmaya only looks out for himself, my uncle always said, but I never wanted to be like that. I lectured myself on walks. I made lists of ways I could improve. Years went by like one unhappy day. My mother tried to teach me the alphabet unsuccessfully. She used a big paper chart attached to a board and pointed to a bird or a little man or a purse and then to the letter that went with them. A whole day was spent trying to get me to draw the semicircle in straight line of the letter Aleph. But I was like something that had been raised in the wild. I didn't know the names of objects. Teachers talked to me and I stared back. My last cheder results before we moved reported my conduct was unsatisfactory, my religion unsatisfactory, my arithmetic unsatisfactory, and even my wood and metal shop work unsatisfactory. My father called it the most miserable report he'd ever seen and invited us all to figure out how I had pulled it off. My mother said I might have been getting better in some areas, and he told her that if God gave me a second or third life, I'd still understand nothing. He said a person with strong character could correct his path and start again, but a coward or a weakling could not. I always wondered if others had such difficulty in learning. I always worried what would become of me if I couldn't do anything at all. It was terrible to have to be the person I was. I spent rainy days building dams in the street to divert the runoff. I found boards and pushed them along puddles with sticks. My mother dragged me out of the storms, saying when she found me that there I sat with my dreams full of fish and pancakes. She said while she bundled me into bed next to the stove that I'd never avoided an illness, from chicken pox to measles to scarlet fever to whooping cough, and that was why I'd spent my whole life 99% dead. At night, I lay waiting for sleep like our neighbor's dog waited for passing wagons. When she heard me, still awake, my mother would come to my bedside, even as tired as she was, to help me sleep. She said that if I squeezed my eyelids tight, lights and planets would float down past them, though I'd never be able to count them before they disappeared. She said that her grandfather told her that God moved those lights and planets with his little finger. I told her I was sorry for the way I was, and she said that she wasn't worried about school, only about how I was with my family and our neighbors. She said that too often my tongue worked, but not my head. Or my head worked, but not my heart. Yet, when my younger brother was born, I told her I wanted him thrown into the chicken coop. I was glum that whole year, when I was four, because of an infected vaccination on my arm. My mother said I played alone even when there were other kids about. Two years went by without my learning a thing. I didn't know how to swim or ride a bicycle. I had no grandparents, no aunts, and no godparents. When I asked why, my father said it was because society's parasites ate well while the worthy received only dirty water, and my mother said it was because of sickness. I attended Hader until my father came back from one of his trips and told my mother that it was 1936 and time for me to get a modern education. <laughs> 
I was happy to change. Since our teacher always had food in his beard and caned us across the fingers for wrong answers and his house smelled like a kennel. So instead I went to public school, which was cleaner all around. My father was impressed that my new teacher dressed in the European style and that after he taught me to read, I started teaching myself. Since I was bored and knew no one, I took to books. And in public school, I met my first friend, whose name was Udall. I liked him. Like me, he had no future. He was always running somewhere with his nose dripping. We made rafts to put in the river and practice long-distance spitting. He called me Shmaya too, and I called him Pisher. When he wasn't well-behaved, he was clever enough to keep the teacher from catching on. One morning before anyone arrived, we played tip cat so violently we broke some classroom windows. We scared the boys who had nice satchels and never went barefoot. He was always getting me into trouble at home. And one Sabbath I was beaten for taking apart the family scissors so I could have two little swords for him and for me. His mother taught him only sad songs, including one about the king of Siberia, before she got sick because of her teeth and died. He came looking for me once she was dead, but I hid from him. He told me the next day that two old men carried her out of the house on a board, and then his father moved him away. That summer, a card arrived for my father from his cousin in Warsaw, telling him there was work in his factory. The factory made fabric out of cotton thread. My father hitched a ride to the city in a truck full of geese and then sent for us. He moved us to 21 Zamenhofer Street, apartment number six. My mother had us each memorize the address so we could find it when we got lost. And my younger brother, who had a bad lung, spent his days at the back window looking out at the garbage bins. We both thought the best thing about the move was the tailor's shop across the square. The tailor made uniforms for the army, and in the front of his window, there were three rows of hand-sized mannequins each dressed in miniature uniforms. We especially loved the tiny service ribbons and medals. Because it was summer, I was expected to work at the factory. So far away, we had to ride the trolley. I was shut up in a little room with no windows and four older boys and set to finishing the fabrics. The bolts had to be scraped until they acquired a grain like you found on winter stockings. Each of them took hours, and someone as small as me had to lean his chest onto the blade to scrape with enough force. On hot days, sweat ran off me like rain off a roof. The other boys said things like, What a fine young man from the country we now have in our midst. He's clearly going to be a big wheel in town. And I thought, Am I only here so they can make fun of me? And I refused to go back. And my father said he would give me such a beating that it would hurt to raise my eyebrows. But while I sat there like a mouse under the broom, my mother stopped him and said there was plenty I could do at home and school was beginning in a few weeks anyway. My father said I'd only been given a partial hiding and she told him that would do for now and that, and that night, once they started snoring, I crept to their beds and kissed her goodnight and pulled the blanket from his feet so that maybe he'd catch a chill Because I couldn't sleep, I helped her with the day's first chores, and she told everyone she was lucky to have a son who didn't mind rising so early. I worked hard and kept her company. I emptied her wash buckets and fetched hot compresses for my brother's chest. She asked if this wasn't much better than breaking bottles and getting into trouble, and I told her it was. I was still so small, I could squat and ride the bristle block of the long-handled brush she used to polish the floors. When she told my father, at least now their children were better behaved, he told her that not one of us looked either well-fed or good-tempered. He joked at dinner that she cooked like a washerwoman. Go to a restaurant, she said in response. She later told me that when she was young, she never complained. So her mother would always know who her best child was and keep her near. So I became myself only once the lights went out, and in the mornings, went back to pretending things were okay. <laughs>
I'm going to stop there. Ready to come up, Dan? Thank you. And this is the interactive part of the evening. Or you'll interact. No, what you said is true. <laughs> well, we'll see. Hello. Can you hear me? Hello. Are we done playing now? <laughs> so, Jim yeah, and Dan, thank you very much for those terrific readings. Thank you. Um, if you'd like to start us off with a question, you can be first. Please raise your hand. We'll get a mic to you. Someone will sprint a mic over to your spot. All you need to do is raise your that hand. That part is true. That part is true. Well, maybe I can start us off then. Go figure. Um, can you both talk about dipping into the well of World War II? Um, is it going back to? It seems like it's going back to something very personal uh, in each of your in the past, in each of your pasts. Hmm. You're on, Dan. <laughs> oh man, it's come to me. Uh, you know, f for me, in some way, uh, it, it's it starts with family history. Um, I grew up with grandparents who, who had come over from Hungary, and my father had come over from Hungary as well, and uh, spent a bunch of time doing research over in Eastern Europe that was, was what led um, to the book. And so, you know, there's some part of me that feels like it's almost like a precognitive thing where there's just this sort of like emotional history that was in the house before I even knew that there were words like world or war or two. Uh, <laughs> and you didn't so, know there was two either, right? That's right. I, I, knew, of, I knew of one I at that, that point. Word, yeah. uh, Echad was where, how far I'd gotten. So, but, you know, in a way, I think the sort of back half of that, and maybe that's where I can pass it over to Jim, is that, so the, so the part that was actually research about, like, World War II was news to me. I mean, I, I, this might sound, like, ridiculous to say out loud in front of a group of people, but, like, I don't even know if there was, that I knew that there was, like, the acronym RAF before I started research. <laughs> like, I knew there were, like, planes and royal people and that there were people who flew in different armies, but, like, the actual sort of, like, battle history part of things was just, it was all news to That's me. That's great. And it was total homework. It's like that moment in The Producers when the guy goes, I never realized the Third Reich meant Germany. <laughs> <laughs> well, I mean, and look, and isn't that part of like what something like research or what history is about, right? Which is the ugly walk around being like, I can like stand up and walk on two legs and I know all this stuff. And then somebody actually asks you a question and you're like, fuck, I don't know anything. <laughs> right? Like I, I always love like they do those NPR things where they're like, if you ask like 12 year olds, how many know of the Holocaust? Only 40% of respond. It's like, well, what if you ask them if they knew, like, who was the president? Right. <laughs> like, there's a way in which, like, we just, we're all sort of walking around with clothes on, pretending like we're, um, you know, sentient. But there's all this stuff that we don't know. Um, I'm glad you mentioned the clothes on part. I, I, it was yeah. a tough decision this morning. So, is that similar for you? Or you no. <laughs> <laughs> totally different. Uh, no, it's sort of like that, I guess. Um, I'd written about the Second World War before, um, but in this case, <laughs> it wasn't a matter of my going, you know, it's time for someone to write a new novel about the Holocaust and I'm the guy to do it, by God. Um, what happened was, um, um, uh, I write about such a weird array of things that um, old students and old friends will often, if they come across something strange, they'll say, send this to Jim. Um, and um, an old student wrote me and said, why have you never written about Janusz Kuszak? Um and Janusz Korszak, for those of you not steeped in Polish history, um, was um, a, a really important educational reformer at the beginning of the 20th century who came up with the radical idea that uh, children were human beings and should be treated with some kind of dignity and that their, their desire should be taken into account in some ways in their education. Um, and that idea he fought for at the beginning of the 20th century and eventually it sort of swept Western Europe. And in the meantime, he had also become uh, a, chil a really famous children's book author and a, and a very famous radio personality. Um, so he was sort of a mix. It's hard to find an American analog for him, but if you imagine a mix of Dr. Spock, Dr. Seuss, and Garrison Keillor, he's sort of like that. Um, and he was about to retire in 1939 after having had a long and illustrious career. He was about to retire to Palestine. Um, <clears throat> he was also one of the few figures that uh, seemed to bring the Poles and the Jews together. Um, he was about to uh, retire to Palestine and the Germans invaded. And he thought, well, I don't think I can leave now. Um, so he ran uh, the most important orphanage in Warsaw, which became the most important orphanage in the Warsaw Ghetto. And in 1942, the Germans came to him and said, um, we're going to liquidate the, uh, your orphanage. We're going to send the children to Treblinka. 
<clears throat> and at that point, everybody knew that Treblinka was a death camp. Um, and they said, you can stay um, because God knows there's going to be more orphans. And he said, no, if my children are going, I'm going with them. And the, the Germans said, all right, suit yourself. But they said, you might want to tell them they're going to a happy place. And he said, no, this has all been about treating the children with dignity, so I'm, in fact, going to tell them the truth, and you're going to watch how we handle this. And at the orphanage was at the very bottom of the ghetto, um, the very southern extremity, and the, the deportation site was at the very northern extent of the ghetto. And it took me, when I visited Warsaw, two and a half hours to walk that distance, and it must have taken the children four or four and a half, um, and they had to do it in midday heat. And the, um, they did it in perfect order, um, in ranks. Um, and the Germans had a rule at that point that um, all Jews who were not being deported had to come out and watch the Jews who were being deported, which meant the entire ghetto watched the children march by. And it was a, an amazing moment for the ghetto, obviously. But it also turned out to be a historical watershed in the way the Germans didn't intend at all, because one of the arguments against resistance had always been well, they're not going to kill everybody. Um, and, if, and it was clear that by that, even by 1942, after Stalingrad, that the Germans were going to lose World, World War II. It was a matter of how long it was going to take. So the argument against resistance was, let's not rile them up. Let's just outlast them. They're not going to kill everybody. But they, the Jews also know how much the Germans respected Kushak as a Jew. And when they saw that Kushak was going to Treblinka, they said, they're, they're going to kill everybody. And they started hoarding weapons at that point. And the Jewish uprising was just a few months later, essentially. So, um, quite a heroic figure. Um, and certainly one of the most important figures in Polish uh, military history in the Second World War. And there's Korszak Institutes all over Poland. And so when this student wrote me and said, why haven't you written about him? Um, I already knew the story, because I'm, I'm the sort of hopeless nerd who reads these sorts of books. Um, and I wrote him back and said, um, because I, I, I'm very uncomfortable actually writing from the point of view of great men or women of history. Um, first of all, because I am much more drawn politically to the worm's eye view, to the uh, regular person's view, since that's most of our views, the person who's impacted by power rather than who wields power. Um, and secondly, because when you have a figure, especially a figure who's saintly, you know, like Gandhi or Dorothy Day or Jesus or... Korshak. What, what conflicts are supposed to be commensurate <laughs> with their saintliness? You know, it's like, well, he's Gandhi, but he has trouble at home, you know. <laughs> like, oh, poor Gandhi, you know. Um, so, but, but I'm also enough of a nerd that I own Korshak's ghetto diary. Um, and so I thought, well, look at it again. I read it again um, and came across an anecdote that I'd forgotten about a boy whose um, mother had said she was dying, and she said, I'm going to keep, I'm going to stay alive long enough to get you into the orphanage. And there was no openings, uh, because, of course, everybody wanted to be in the orphanage. And um, she stayed alive for that reason. And then finally, Koshak came to the family and said, there's an opening. The mother died immediately. The boy was taken into the orphanage, and the boy was inconsolable. And so the boy screamed for three days. And um, finally, Koshak um, quieted him down by saying, if you don't stop screaming, I'm going to turn you over to the Germans. And now a normal person hearing that story would say, oh, so in fact you can write about a great man because look, they have difficult decisions to make every day. If you don't stop, I'm going to turn you over to the Germans. What a dilemma. I went, what, would it must, what must it have been like to be that child? Um, and it suddenly occurred to me that although I'd read a lot of... Um, First-person uh, accounts, and you know, if you go to the Holocaust Museum or you interview people, there are a few um, Korshak orphans who got out before the ghetto was liquidated, so they, there are still people who knew him. When you interview those people or, or, or hear their interviews, they, they're very reverent. You know, they say he was an amazing man. He was uh, astonishing. But that's with years and years of hindsight. Um, and it occurred to me, reading his ghetto diary again, that no, none of those children wanted to be there. And in fact, they were all miserable there. And the idea that you would be the person who made a saint's life harder, that I could relate to. <laughs> that suddenly was my personal way into this. And that I felt, oh, yes, I know that kid, essentially. The kid who knows he should be <clears throat> behaving better but isn't. 
Um, and so suddenly I had a whole new angle on the thing. And I guess we're just about out of time, aren't we? No. <laughs> well, <laughs> no, I was that gonna, was a little yeah, long we have two minutes. I was, I was just going to ask you, I mean, there's just this like astonishing uh, bibliography at the end of the book. And, 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 and it's a, um, and I say this in the, the most laudatory way, but it's a very distilled book, right? I mean, mm -hmm. it's, it's 250 pages, but, but they're like very, very specifically written pages. And um, I mean, I, I guess I've always wondered... So like part of my research experience was just sort of like skimming a lot of what I was reading because I get bored really easily. <laughs> and I feel like I always hear people, like I would hear people give, tell a story like the one you just told. And I was like, yes, like what you need to do is find that one sentence. It's like this amazing detail, but you have to like read 400 pages. To get there, <laughs> and I never wanted to do that. But, so, but I was interested to know, like, like, did you know at what point in the midst of all of that reading, like, okay, now I can stop? Or, or had you done, like, what was the experience? Sort of well, see, the thing is, about? I'm the sort of hopeless nerd who's doing that reading when I'm not working on books. So what'll happen is I'll just be reading weird shit anyway, and then a project will begin, and I'll be like, oh, actually, I, now I need to read more on this subject. But I'll start writing well before I'm finished researching, because I'm really never finished researching. Right. And also the writing will tell me what I need to learn next, essentially, uh -huh. right? And I also wonder, just like dramatically, um, for, for those of you who haven't read the book, we, which like, is we, almost everybody, really, which is n no one on the planet. Yeah, exactly. But uh, mm. like we sort of see, we get to see this 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 figure sort of shadowly on the on the side, and then we don't really meet him for like almost a hundred pages. This figure being Kushak, you mean? Right. Yeah. 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 Um, so was that like a conscious dramatic decision to say like here's this figure that we know is going to be a big deal, but I'm going to kind of hold him off, or, or how did you just feel your way through that? Subconsciously, or um, you know, part of it was that, but part of it too is that it's the you know it's the boy's story, and it's the and the the boy is focused on a whole lot of other things. So it's not like if you imagine the analog, it's not like you know everything is going crazy in America and uh, it looks incredibly terrible. What's Garrison Keillor up to anyway? You know, it's like who cares? I don't know what the guy's you know. I mean, he's way off in the. And also when you're writing that kind of, as you know, that kind of historical fiction, one of the things you have as an advantage is that the reader knows what's coming. And one of the things you have as a disadvantage is the reader knows what's coming. <laughs> so you want to um, actually play with that uh, expectation on the reader's part um, as much as you can and, and, and make clear that you're aware of it. And there's a kind of a wonderful tension between, um, you know, for, if you're writing about historical catastrophe, the reader has a very vivid sense of dread. Right, so it's like if I start to write, if I'm writing a novel about a Titanic, and it's like, oh look, a happy couple, and the reader's going, uh oh, <laughs> you better enjoy yourselves now, honey, you know that kind of thing. But there's a big conflict, uh, tension between what the reader knows and what the characters, what's opaque to the characters, essentially. Um, and I, I like playing with that tension as well. And so Korshak will appear in the book and go back and forth, and the, the astute reader will go, oh, there he goes. And the, the less astute reader will go, I who is that? I don't know, you know. Which is sort of what the boy's doing anyway. So, right. How about you in the audience? Any yeah, questions? Yeah, now they're filled with questions. <laughs> Rachel, right in the middle here. Thank you. So I know you started your book quite a long time ago. Um, and there was obviously years that went into this. So you couldn't have known that we would arrive at this moment. But I am curious with the tensions in Europe around uh, the Jewish communities there, um, and also sort of the general political situation that we find ourselves in this summer of 2015. It does seem striking that your books would come out now. And I just wonder, although I'm sure you couldn't have known and therefore couldn't have intended it, what is it like? Could you just sort of speak to the current political cultural moment, thinking back to this history of never forget? You know, I, I'm about to teach a Holocaust um, class, a, a class on the Holocaust to high school students in urban North Philadelphia this summer. So I'm really curious about your views on this. Yeah, um, you know, I think f for me, like a, a starting place, and it's going to sound tangential from that good question that you asked, but I'm going to get there, so give me a second. Um, I mean, you <laughs> know, in. Ez Ezra Pound ha ha had this great thing where he said, literature is news that stays news, right? So in some way, like when you're sitting down to write a novel, I think on some level, like you're aiming for some level of universality, but you're also, um, 
like one can never say, well, so here's this thing that's happening outside of sort of the realm of history. Um, we're looking at people and people have done horrible things to each other for all of eternity. Um, one question that I got asked, one of the things that happens in Poxel is that we learn later that he's fabricated aspects of his memoir. And it just happened that the book came out like two weeks after this big awful thing happened to Brian Williams where he had been on stage and, and, and told uh, some versions of a story when he was in Iraq that turned out to have been um, embellished. I don't want to get into the details of it. Um, and I got asked a lot of questions as the book was coming out, like, how did you, you know, isn't this timing amazing? And there's just the sense where it's just like, this happens like every six months to somebody. And, it's, and, and, and on some level, it's just a question of sort of like how visible they are. Brian Williams happens to, to talk to tens of millions of people all the time. And so it became a sort of thing, right? And so I guess uh, maybe the thing I'm trying to say in a hopefully not offensive way is that um, like there is a kind of eternally recurring sense of, of just these like awful things that people do to each other. And, and some of them tend to kind of follow along with like economic downturns, right? Like uh, once things start to, once the bubbles burst, whatever they are, people start to get mad at each other and then they, and then they start to pick out the people they want to be mad at. And um, for 5,000 years, Jews have seemed to have been a pretty good, good group to do that to. And you know, I don't want to be in any way flippant, especially given the material that Jim is is working with, because because I think I've chosen to look at like one very specific version of things. Um, I mean, and I should also say out loud, virtually everybody in my family, with the exception of my grandparents and a couple of their relatives, were were killed during the, that war. And so, uh, you know, it, it's it, it's a level of atrocity that is almost unspeakable. But I mean only to say that at the same time. Like to sort of pick out any given moment and feel like, well, there's this political thing that's happening that feels like it's somehow separate or, or, or outside of um, history. Like that, I'm not sure that I'll, I'll ever be able to, to sort of get down with that. And, and there's a sense that, um, like, it's that universality that, that that I'm always looking for as a novelist to try to pick, pick out. I mean, does that feel separate from what you were looking yeah, at? Yeah, it's actually a lovely question you asked, and I think there, a version of what I, I would answer a version of the same answer, which is kind of there's such a lament, lamentable sense of how cyclic um, this kind of hostility is, that when you say, oh my God, what timing? You go, unfortunately, <laughs> it's almost always uh, time for a, a congruence with some kind of horrible anti-Semitic thing. And so um, it's a little bit like a, a previous novel of mine uh, was about uh, school shootings. And someone said, that's amazing. How did you time it? And I said, you're joking, right? Um, we just have a school shooting every two years or so. Um, part of what I think uh, writers like myself are doing when we're deciding to write um, about historical subjects is we're not just saying that seems like a good story. We're, enter we're being galvanized by something in the zeitgeist, something that we feel is a problem right here and right now. Um, and that's what makes it emotionally um, urgent as opposed to uh, simply a, an exercise of some sort. And that's what gives it a kind of... Uh, a sense of importance, if it has a sense of importance, I think. And so that means we're plugging into exactly what you're saying. And and maybe there's a specific one where we go, oh my God, I, that's really particularly horrible. But again, I think it's such a lamentable cycle um, that um, whatever year this book came out, it would have been like, well, that's, here's another story, you know, that kind of thing. Well, and I, mean, I think also what feels exciting to me about a book like Jim's or, or just thinking about like how to how you might bring this to high school students or to people who are reading about it in literature is um, like sometimes it's, it is just almost inconceivable to say 6 million people, 9 million people, 20 million people in Stalin's Russia. Um, but if you say, well, well, one voice, right? One voice well told that sounds like a person, like maybe that's comprehensible. And in a way, like I think, like I know that's what I read for in any way. And maybe that's what And I that's was, sort of what literature does as well. I mean, it educates us emotionally. And it, and it tries to, by extending our empathetic imagination, allow us to imagine what some of these statistics actually mean. You know, there's a, I don't know how many uh, people here have been to um, Auschwitz, but there's a, um, you know, there's all of these uh, parts of the ex ex exhibition that are, that deal with some numbers of such staggering size that you really even can't wrap your mind around it. And, you know, when you look at a you know, 50,000 baby shoes, your mind just shuts off. Or you look at, you know, a, a pile of women's hair that's the size of, you know, a, a boxcar, your mind just shuts off in some ways. But there's one room where it's just, just one narrow hallway and it's just, you know, the, the, the Germans, Nazis took photos of every incoming inmate. And it's just photos of the inmates all the way down 
uh, both sides of the wall. And so that means, you know, it's probably 400 photos, not so many. But you walk down that hallway and you're just completely undone because you think in a way that it sort of teaches you how the Holocaust makes children of all of us, really. But you walk down the hallway and you think, oh, my God, so many people died. And, it, you know, it's 400 or 300 or something. And you think, that's so many people because you, you simply can't go there with 6 million in some ways in emotional terms. So it, literature does a version of that. You know, I just got, uh, uh, you know, uh, um, there's, a, there's a way in which when you write about one person, you're giving up scope and you're giving up a kind of comprehensive image, but you're asking somebody to go, here's what, here's what it was like for this one person. Right? Yeah, and, and maybe that's what I was trying to say about the research stuff before, which is that I think for me, so like I started reading these like beautiful John Keegan military histories where it's like 400 pages, like <laughs> every single thing that happened in a battle, and at some point after about 100 right. pages, I was just like, are there like people in any of these things or in these <laughs> tanks? And, um, and then actually like what became most useful to me were just self-published memoirs. Um, that aren't, that you, I mean, the idea of a self-published memoir of, like, for instance, somebody who was, like, in Rhodesia in Zimbabwe training for the Royal Air Force during World War II, like, how, and I mean this not in a critical way, but how, like, sort of not exciting must the writing itself be for that not to have been published right, by right. a publisher? Um, and, and maybe it doesn't have the sort of dramatic thrust or the lyrical thrust or the poetic thrust that would make someone want to read it and buy it. But for thinking about writing a book, there is that sense, like not six million, not nine million, but like one person dying. I mean, in a way, isn't that sort of like the empathetic move of what it means to read a book, right? Mm -hmm. It's just to have that sense of, um, like I, I have all these students who want to write about like dragons and um, what are the other things that don't exist? Uh, like <laughs> elves and, and, and vampires and, and um, you know, in, in a way what I find myself always, always saying to them is just like, well, it's actually like just as sort of supernatural to say like I can jump into the head of an eight-year-old kid somewhere, right? Like you can't do that either. And so in a way, like maybe that's why we want to read right. these and books. And then they go, but could the eight-year-old kid drink blood? <laughs> right, right, right. That would be great. Only on Fridays. Yeah, but no, yeah. I mean, there, and there is a way in which like that's the, um, at least for me, like I think that's what I find myself seeking in books and, and, um, and, and maybe that's, that's why we want to read them about this subject. Jim, you had brought up ethical passivity earlier and I wonder mm -hmm. if either of you think literature is an antidote to that. Well, I think literature, um, by definition, is in, in some ways showing us how we live. Um, and then the implication following that would be then it, it has to be showing us how to live as well. Um, and you know, I'm always struck by um, the, the, the amount of space devoted in literature to people who are in proximity to great power as opposed to you know, uh, no, novels or short stories about what it's like to be Caesar or what it's like to be you know, Napoleon or whatever. And, and uh, in, it's, it's very easy for all of us in proximity to power to say, well, what can we do, you know, or we've done all we can, or that kind of thing, and, and to slip into um, that kind of sense of, well, my heart's in the right place. Um, and I'm interested in, in dramatizing that under the maximum sort of pressure, essentially. And so I'm, I'm usually writing about situations where somebody sort of means well, would pretty much like to be left alone, would like not to have difficult choices. Um, but um, part of what it means to be in a situation like the one I'm writing about is to have only difficult choices, I think. And then not making choices then becomes really problematic. Right? Um, well, and, and I think also just like thinking about the dramatic thrust of a book, like that thing, I, I love that Philip Roth, when he was asked, like, you know, what, what's your sort of main thing that you're going for? He said, all my characters are always busy at the act of choosing. Mm -hmm. right? And in a way, like that's, like, that's what allows like these books to get you guys to read them, is that sense, like, well, what are the choices these characters are making? And I know for me, um, so like there was this sort of like other ethically um, problematic situation that, that I uncovered that I don't think I knew I was going to uncover, which is, um, in looking at this Jew who had flown for the Royal Air Force, and, and since writing the book, I think I thought there were probably like you know a handful, but I've been hearing from like tons of people who are like, my grandfather <laughs> is Polish. And flew. I mean, it's amazing how many people it turns out that there were just right. all of these Jews who did fight um, in the active war effort in Britain. And um, I had this sort of initial sort of almost inglorious bastards Quentin Tarantino version of what I thought the book was going to be. <laughs> right, this kid finds out that his, his uncle was flying for the Royal Air Force and dropped these bombs and was killing all, all these Germans and, and they were going to be Nazis he was killing and that wasn't going to be complicated. But what turned out to be the case was that the bombers and the fighters that um, Canada and the US and Britain were flying in 1944 and 1945 hadn't been invented when the war started. They essentially were what turned the war. Jim was mm -hmm. talking about this very complicated period from 1942 
when his book ends, to 1945, when the war was essentially decided but still ongoing. And um, there were hundreds of millions to billions of dollars that have been spent by those three governments to just make all of these huge bombs that could kill tens of thousands of people. And um, you know, Churchill and, and, and Roosevelt even, I think, felt that, that um, this kind of blanket bombing that was going on could stop, and it didn't, uh, and it ended up leveling um, 132 German cities. There were 8 million German civilians who were left homeless. Um, and so it ended up becoming, you know, while writing, uh, it turned out I was writing a book about uh, a guy who was very, very conflicted about having um, perpetrated a, a kind of violence that I think a lot of, uh, that I didn't even know had, had happened, right? Mm -hmm. And in a way, like it was this weird ethical dilemma that I went through myself of, of uncovering this historical moment and realizing um, that there's like a, there's this underside to like whatever histories we uncover. This is also why when you were saying, when do you know you can start writing in terms of research, until you start writing, you don't realize that you're teaching yourself, right? And you're sort of going, oh, this is not going to be the design I had at all. Right. And you're going to have to devote a lot of words to that, right? <laughs> exactly. Another question from the audience? Another question. Yeah. There's one. No. Hi. 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 This is a question for Dan, but I think it could apply to Jim as I well. I bet it only applies to Dan. I'm pretty sure. <laughs> yes, so, I like Jim. <laughs> so I'm wondering how much your cultural identity um, plays a role in what you choose to write. And so maybe more specifically, I was wondering, like for Dan, as a child of an immigrant and of um, your grandparents are immigrants, sort of like your relationship to their cultural identity and like how you feel like, do you feel like there's a sense of reclaiming the identity in terms of like why you choose to write about what you write? about? <laughs> yeah, good question. I, you know, I, I think it's really complicated. I think I thought when I started writing these first two books that it was sort of all important. Um, and then in a way, like in finding my subject matter, that was what was going to make the books live. And, and I had the experience of going up to get an MFA up at Syracuse where I went to study with a writer who I really love, short story writer George Saunders. And at some point with my first book, he kind of said, you know, listen, like, it seems like you're almost... Uh, putting too much weight into the fact that this character uh, is Jewish. Uh, and, and the question he asked, and I think it's what the complicated part of the question that you were just asking was, well, what if this, you know, what if this kid's parents were Samoan uh, immigrants? What if, what, if they, what if they had come from Ethiopia? Like, what, what, in what ways would that be the same universal experience? And so I guess what I mean to say is, like, I wouldn't want to diminish the fact that, like, we're always sort of looking back to our antecedents. It's hard to imagine a book that isn't doing that in some way with its characters, right? Um, but at the same time, if somehow it turns into American exceptionalism or Jewish exceptionalism or Dan exceptionalism or Jim exceptionalism, like then that thing maybe isn't universal anymore. Uh, there's a writer, Richard Yates, who I really love, who in an interview about his book, Revolutionary Road, was asked, like, why is it so hard to write autobiographical fiction? And he said, I always have to try to avoid the two great traps, self-aggrandizement and self-pity. And in a way, like, that kind of said everything to me because it was just like, so what's the third thing, <laughs> right? Like, I mean, in a way, and I think maybe that's the, the answer for me to the question that you're asking, which is, um, like, the material is the material, but in a way it's almost sort of value-free. And then there's tone, which is really hard. What's your approach to the subject matter? And if it starts to become self-aggrandizing, it grows problematic for the reader. And if it starts to be self-pitying, it grows problematic for the reader. And in a way, like, whatever that third way is, like, that's the thing, right? And it might be hard to put a name to it, um, but if it, if it tips too far into, the, into one of those two sides, it starts to feel like pathos instead of, um, like, a, a literature or, or the, you know, be, being uh, open to that empathy. Hmm. That's a good answer. <laughs> <laughs> Time for one more question. Yep. Wow, she has to go all the way to the back. <laughs> I think that person was just saying he was leaving. Hi, this is a question, whoa, for Jim. Um, Hi. If I can ask about craft for a minute. Okay. Um, you know, you talked about the tensions that coalesced to make you interested in this book and the research that led you into thinking about it. At what point in this process does the voice of your Worm's Eye View narrator emerge? Oh, your stories and books are driven by these voices that are authentic and honest and still s very smart and revealing, but they seem to drive and carry the stories. Do you start with the voice? Do you wait till it emerges? Is it uh, a lot of process? A lot of these are starting with voices, yeah, actually, because um, what's happening is once I decide it's a first-person narrator, and in a case like this when, when the project is utterly hubristic, 
and I'm thinking, who in their right mind would do this? Um, then I think, well, I have to come at the problem head on. And so I'm, I'm, I'm thinking, let me try a first person voice. And so what I'm doing is um, immersing myself also in a lot of primary texts. It turns out there's a lot of stuff written about Polish and Jewish childhoods in the teens and 20s and 30s. And after having immersed myself in a lot of those, I start to sort of play around with voices. And when I start to get a voice that sounds slightly uh, both authentic to my ear, having uh, tried to absorb as much of this as I can, and uh, authentic to my own emotions, then I start to um, let him ramble, let him go, essentially. And often that kind of voice will then tell me also stuff I need to know, is what I was sort of saying to Dan, and that'll lead my research in various places. For example, I wrote a story a few years ago uh, about the uh, Chernobyl disaster, and it was narrated by one of the senior turbine engineers. And he's narrating, and he just says, well, I went to school in... And I was like, oh, where, I, I don't know where he went to school. Um, <laughs> and it suddenly occurred to me, not only did I not know where he went to school, but I had no idea what the Soviet secondary school system was like. And so now I'm taking out research that no one in their right mind would want to take out, uh, books that no one has ever checked out before or since, I think. <laughs> And books that don't, you would only read the way Dan was saying you would read them, right? You don't, you don't absorb a 500-page tome on it. But you are trying to figure out some basic things about the, the um, system. And that's also altering your voice a little bit as you go, right? Um, and so the other thing that I'm doing, and, and Dan probably does this as well, I think most writers do, every morning you go back over what you did the day before, and sometimes that means you never get any farther. You just deal with the mess you did the year, day before. And that in my case with something like my novel is uh, refining the voice, refining the voice, refining the voice, refining the voice over and over again. So the, so the voice is something I need right at the very beginning to have a sense of what it is. But that sense is pretty illusory. I'm sort of fooling myself that I know what I'm doing at that point. And I think that's true of almost all the novelists I admire. The, 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 the opening is such a leap of faith that you're, you think you know what you're doing and thank God you don't have an accurate sense of how wrong you are. <laughs> and then a little ways in you start to teach yourself and it's a little bit like, you, ooh, I'm glad nobody read that earlier version, you know, that kind of thing. <laughs> and you just make it less and less awful as you go along, essentially. I hope that's a good answer. Here's to less awful. Please join me in thanking Jim Shepard and Daniel Today. Yeah, less awful is a good place to end. Thank you.